Okay, so we're pleased to have Evan Patterson from Stanford uh, talking about applied category theory in Julia. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's great to see such a full room. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Evan. I'm a fifth year PhD student in the stats department at Stanford. And today I'm going to tell you about some of my ongoing efforts to do applied and computational category theory in the Julia programming language. Um, so as far as I know, applications of category theory, at least outside of pure math, started in sort of logic and programming language theory. Um, but by now, they've spread to all sorts of different areas. So I've just mentioned a, f a few here, um, such as uh, quantum mechanics. Um, there's been a lot of stuff in databases and no in the related area of knowledge representation. Um, recently, there's been work on control theory and robotics and, and closer to where I nominally work, uh, probability and statistics, uh, just, to, just to name a few. And um, I think the, the reason for this is that, is that category theory really offers a, a unifying perspective on how to build mathematical models for things that are compositional. And uh, that's not a claim I'm really going to defend here. It's more like a premise for this work. Right, that category theory is, is useful for doing this. Um, but in, in any kind of applied mathematics, doing the math, creating the mathematical model is only part of the story. And I mean, at least I believe that for, for any field of applied math to ultimately be considered successful, it needs to feed into producing new and better um, scientific and computational methods. And in today's world, software is a big part of how math becomes instantiated as new technologies. Um, however, I think it's fair to say that the software tools that exist for ACT right now are immature. I mean, they're certainly fragmented in the sense that like there aren't really any standards for doing anything. It's, it's kind of, I think it's kind of the wild, wild west for computational category theory. Um, and so the, the question that I've you know, have been exploring in this work and that we'll explore in this talk is, you know, what, what, are, what might be some components of a system for um, instantiating mathematical models from applied category theory on, on computers? Um, now, before I go on, I want to make, make a distinction between two different ways we might think of the relationship between category theory and software. Um, so the first, uh, you might call it designing with categories. So from this point of view, category theory offers a, a toolbox of ideas to help you design and structure program. So the slogan that you, you might have for this is like, it's, well, it's like design patterns, but hopefully better because they're based on patterns that have already been seen to be successful in mathematics. So there's an ongoing course right now. Many of you are attending the lectures called Programming with Categories. And I think this is kind of the, the philosophy of this course. Is it fair, fair to say? Um, so a another thing that you might consider is, well, how can I compute on categories as algebraic structures, right? So like, what, what are the data structures and algorithms required to do the computer algebra of category theory? And, and, and more generally, to compute on categories. And so both of these things are very interesting, uh, but, I th but the point I want to make is that they're not the same. And, and really, so, so this talk is really about the second one. It's about how do we compute on categories. Um, OK. And so, so for several years on and off now, um, I've been um, developing this package called uh, CatLab, which is a stupid pun on MATLAB. And uh, it's a. Uh, a, a Julia package that aims to do a couple different things. I mean, in the first instance, it's supposed to be a, a programming library that other people could use as a starting point to do applied category theory in, in their domain. Um, I would like it to eventually have aspects of a computer algebra system for categories, and also to be uh, an interactive computing environment. Although, to be fair, in this case, it's really uh, Jupyter that's sort of doing the work here, but there is still, you know, you can run it in Jupyter notebooks and get diagrams and so on. So some specific features that already exist, at least in some form, are the ability to work with symbolic expressions that represent objects or morphisms in, like, say, a finitely presented category or monoidal category. The ability to, um, you know, manipulate 
and uh, transform and visualize uh, wiring diagrams, as well as some capabilities for generating and parsing uh, code from, to and from morphisms. So to elaborate on this a little bit, I mean, you know, there are a lot of directions I'd like to see this project go, but I think today one of the most useful things that it can do is kind of move between these different ways of representing a morphism on a computer, right? How might you do that, right? So you can represent them as these symbolic expressions in terms of like, you know, mon composition and monodal products and stuff. Um, you can represent morphisms in monodal categories, wiring diagrams, which is like a graphical syntax. And you can also represent them as code. And so CatLab provides facilities for transforming between all these three different representations. And we'll, uh, we'll sort of see examples of these different arrows in this diagram as we go along. OK, so I also wanted to make a quick plug for Julia, explain like, well, what, why Julia? There's lots of different languages you can do things in. So um, there's a couple reasons why I chose Julia. So. Um, on the one hand, Julia is, as you may know, a very, it's a new programming language. It has a modern design in many ways. And, and in particular, it has some features which are, are quite nice specifically for doing like applied category theory. So one thing you have is um, a system for multiple dispatch. So as we'll see, you can have like a generic function like compose and then overload it for lots of different types. So you can use like the notion of composition in a lot of different contexts. Uh, this is really a cosmetic thing, but it's still nice. You can have like Unicode binary operators and stuff. So you can write things that kind of look like, you know, normal math notation. Um, and less superficially, it has a, a, a full-fledged macro system that's actually quite powerful. And, and we'll exploit that to put some syntactic sugar on things um, uh, as well. So, um, but apart from these sort of kind of, uh, you know, language design features, Julia is really, uh, was designed from the ground up to be a practical programming language and to perform fast. Um, and it's a growing force in the sort of the more conventional community for applied math. So this would include things like numerical linear algebra and ODEs and PDEs and stats and machine learning and stuff. And, you know, the way I see it, um, you know, everyone comes from their own perspective, but for me at least, I'd like to see applied category theory be part of the broader applied math community, and I think using Julia is one way to sort of connect to what other people are doing in different fields, because there's a lot that people are using Julia for. Okay, um, so I'd be remiss not to just mention some of the other projects that people have done or are working on. This is by no means a complete list, but I'll just mention a few. Um, so the original inspiration for this project actually came from a, a, an earlier project by Jason Morton called uh, Katina, it was also implemented in Julia. Um, it, it's been abandoned for a while, but I certainly drew some inspiration from that. Um, um, so Conexus has created, uh, you know, along with, uh, you know, headed by Ryan Wisniewski and with David and others, have created um, kind of a categorical query language that has some computer algebra capabilities for um, regular categories. Um, uh, there's this startup state box, which is doing some interesting stuff. They seem to have kind of a focus on formal verification. And there's also been a number of kind of rewriters or proof assistants in the area of monodal categories or higher categories. Um, I've listed a few here. Um, so I'm not going to have time to sort of break down all these different things and say what they do. I will say that there's surprisingly, it seems to me at least, there's surprisingly little overlap between a lot of these things. So people are still trying to figure out like what, what is what should be, like, the, like what are the capabilities that we want to have in, in computational category theory. So I think there's a lot of room for people to explore and hopefully learn some things from each other. Okay, so, um, so much for the introduction. Um, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to spend most of my time just sort of going through some of the stuff that you can do with CatLab. I'm going to show you some code snippets and show you what it does. Um, at the end, I'll mention a few applications, some things that I and, and, and other people have tried to do with CatLab. Uh, that'll be fairly brief. And at the end, I'll mention also some of the places I'd like to see the project go. OK. So one of the, so one of the basic things you can do in CatLab is define the signature of certain kinds of algebraic structures. And I'll be a little more precise later about kind of what things I have in mind. But for now, let's just look at this code snippet. Um, so 
focus on the signature block. So I, ha I have a, a Julia macro here called signature, which allows me to write down the types and operations that you have in a category. So this is not quite valid Julia code because Julia doesn't have sort of a, like a notion of dependent types in the way that it's normally understood. Um, but I can write this down and then, and then, I, and then um, this macro will, will get something out of this. And so specifically, at, what one thing it does is, um, well, sh uh, before I go say that, I should say that I've included this here for uh, sort of just demonstration purposes. A signature for categories as well as many others are included in sort of the, the standard library. But there's nothing really special here. This is more or less what it is included in the, in the official thing. So by calling this, this generates some, some stub methods for the related to the types and the, the terms in this theory, right? So um, operating on objects, there's an identity function. And then um, operating on morphisms, there's the domain and codomain and also a compose function. So these are synthesized by the, the software when you, when you call this instance macro. And then these can be basically instantiated in different ways. So those don't yet do anything, but we can define different categories. So we can say for particular kinds of concrete data types in Julia, we can say that this is sort of an instance of a category. Um, and this aspect has a little bit of the flavor of like Haskell type classes or something if you're familiar with that. Um, and then we can also instantiate the signature in systems of symbolic expressions, right? So like uh, expression trees that you can use to manipulate expressions for morphisms or something as in a computer algebra system. Okay, so I'll show an example of each of these. So here what I'm going to say is I'm going to create an instance of the category signature where the objects are these, this struct type I've created called matrix domain. So it just consists of like what element type the matrix is going to have, um, like integer or or floating point or whatever, as well as a dimension. And then the morphism will be instantiated by uh, the matrix type, which is built into the Julia programming language. So I don't have to define that. And then I provided a few, I provided some very simple you know, implementation here. So composition in a category of matrices is just matrix multiplication. So that's what appears at the end here, for example. Okay, and so having done that, I can create a matrix like I ordinarily would in, in Julia. And then I can call these generic functions um, to give basically a categorical interface for, for this particular kind of category. So that sort of works as you might expect. OK. Yes? And when you define a category, uh -huh. um, in addition to the, you know, the type of the objects, yeah, I'll come to I'll come to I'll come to that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the other way you can uh, instantiate a signature is by creating like a syntax system. So these are symbolic expressions that are sort of uh, you know suitably typed. Um, so by default, you can just say well. I'm not going to provide any simplification logic for these expressions. So if I just create, if I call the syntax macro with an empty body, what I get are just basically expression trees that have no simplification whatsoever, right? So if I do compose fg with compose h, like that, that bracketing is preserved um, exactly as written. So, but you can also say, um, let me. Well, okay, let me, before getting to that, let me mention something else. So uh, these different expressions have types. So if you're familiar with the Julia programming language, you'll see that these types are sort of tagged with like what the operation is. So if I have a composition of two things, like the head of that tree has this compose tag attached to it, which means that you could actually dispatch on that. Um, as in using the Julia language. So if you're not familiar with Julia, it's not a super important point. Um, there's also kind of Unicode syntax. So you can write f.g for compose or g circ f for compose with the opposite uh, convention for 
uh, composition. Um, right, so as I've noted, like there's no, by default, there's no kind of simplification, right? So the associativity law is, is not true, right? So these expressions um, are not equal to each other. Um, but we can add some simplification logic, right? So here I'm using a function which is built into CatLab that basically is going to handle the, both the associativity and the unitality. So, um, so, uh, so for example, having done this, it's now the case that the associative law and the, and the unitality laws are actually true for these expressions because the trees are simplifying themselves. Um, and I just want to mention, like, this is built in, but you can kind of define your own simplification logic. So it's supposed to be a flexible system where, for different kinds of categories, you can have different kinds of, multiple kinds of simplification depending on what you, you need for your application. Um, and so what is it actually doing here? It's, it's unbiasing. So how, you, how are you normalizing the associativity? What it's doing is the the classic trick from computer algebra, you just represent that as a, as a longer list. So now if you have a composite of three things, it's not a, a binary tree, it gets flattened out into a tree with three children. Okay, so let me take a little interlude here to explain like what is the formalism, the, the mathematical formalism I'm using for this. So these, what I've been calling signatures are actually based on these things called generalized algebraic theories, or uh, known affectionately as, as GATs. Uh, so these were invented by John Cartmel in his PhD thesis, and which he and he later published a paper on this. Um, you can think of GATs as being like like typed algebraic theories, but you add into that some very simple form of dependent typing. So you can say that like so. So the classic example is like the the HOM in a category, it depends on two, the value, two values, right? One, the, the domain and the codomain. Um, and this is kind of a technical point. If you're familiar with it, these have basically the same expressivity as what have been called essentially algebraic theories, um, at least in set theoretic uh, models. Um, but the, the main point here is that this is maybe one of like the simplest logical systems you could have in which it's possible to like axiomatize structures like categories and monoidal categories and so on. Uh, so yeah, one caveat getting to your question. Um, right now, like CatLab only really does anything with the signature of the theory. So, so like where are the associativity axioms? It's not enforcing them. And so right now it doesn't even let you write them down. But in the future, um, I'd like to have a way of specifying the axioms and maybe even trying to validate them in some way, but that's sort of something else. Um, and as a more general question, I, I think, you know, to me, I mean, I don't really know what the answer to this question is, like, wh what is the right way to um, represent the, what is sometimes called doctrines for different kinds of categories, like categories or minoral categories, complex closed categories. Um, and you kind of want to be able to, to, you know, work with those theories, to treat them as data, to create new ones from old ones. And what is the right way to think about that? That's sort of food for thought. But for now, I'm sort of working with these GATs. Okay. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is wiring diagrams. So um, uh, these are also known as, as string diagrams and by computer scientists, sometimes also port graphs. But uh, what they are is a graphical syntax um, for morphisms in uh, symmetric monoidal categories. So um, probably a lot of you have seen something like this before if you've been working in applied category theory. But, but you know, for example, here is the kind of a, a symbolic expression for a, a morphism, right? You get by tensoring F with G, applying a braiding, then composing with H, then applying another braiding. Well, it's a lot more transparent to draw it as a as this wiring diagram, and um, but those represent the same morphism. Okay, so CatLab has um, pr fairly extensive support for for wiring diagrams, and so I'll summarize some of the things it can do. So, um, but before that, I want to clarify something. So, 
there are two kind of notions of what a wiring diagram or a string diagram might be. So um, you can think of them as like combinatorial things, like just like a graph, right? So there's no geometry there. And so that's normally what I mean by a wiring diagram. It's a data structure. It, it's not a visualization. Um, but of course, you also do want to draw them, and, and CatLab has facilities for, for doing that. But when I talk about wiring diagrams, I, I usually mean like wiring diagrams as a combinatorial thing. Okay, another uh, distinction that I'd like to note briefly is that um, sometimes pe people also talk about undirected wiring diagrams, which are nice for things like relations. Right now, CatLab does directed, di di directed diagrams, but um, in the future, I'd also like to have some support for the undirected flavor. Okay. So how, how are these implemented as a data structure? So I'll explain this. So um, the way I do it is I basically have built the wiring diagrams on top of a simpler data structure, namely just a, a directed graph. And for that, I use the standard package for working with graphs in Julia, which is this thing called lightgraphs.jl. And, and in this encoding, basically every box in your diagram maps to a vertex in, in the underlying directed graph. And then what we do is we create two special, uh, two special vertices that represent the inputs and the, and the outputs, right? So if we go back to this picture, right, there would be basically a special vertex representing where these wires are going and a special vertex where, where these are coming from. Okay, and... Um, Right, and so, as I said, like, this is kind of a generic data structure and it allows you to attach whatever kind of data you want to the boxes or to the ports or to the wires. So it's often convenient to store relevant data and it lets you do that in more or less an arbitrary way. Um, okay, so there, there are two ways you can work with di wiring diagrams that the system provides. One is like a very like nuts and bolts imperative approach where you just issue commands to like add a box or remove a box or add a wire here or move a wire there. Um, and then there's also a more categorical interface that is, is functional in nature and that uses the, the, the normal vocabulary of monodal categories. So composing and tensoring and so forth. So we'll see both of them. So I want to start with the imperative one because it kind of shows you like in a really nuts and bolts way like how to work with these things. And sometimes it's convenient to do it in this low level way. So I'm reconstructing here the diagram that I showed earlier. And um, you don't need to study it in detail. I just want to point out that you can see from the representation, like there's five vertices. Two of them correspond to the inputs and the outputs. And then the other three are the three boxes. So um, conceptually, at least, that should be fairly um, straightforward. Although you typically, when the wiring diagrams get big, you don't want to try to read it from this representation. It's kind of kludgy. Um, uh, often, it's more convenient to build the wiring diagrams up uh, compositionally, right? So uh, here, so one way to do that is to start with some singleton diagrams, by which I mean a diagram just containing a single box. And then I can tensor those together and do braidings and so on. And so here I'm just checking that the wiring diagram I form using this syntax is the same one I just constructed um, by hand. Um, so one point here is that, you know, I talked about instances earlier. So there's a signature for symmetric monodal categories. Um, and wiring diagrams are all instances of that signature. But you can also have wiring diagrams for other kinds of doctrines which may have like more structure to them. So like if you have a, a Cartesian monodal category where you have notions, natural notions of copying and deleting, you can have that and you can basically parameterize, type parameterize the wiring diagram type to say like, okay, I have this extra structure. So it lets you do that. Um, so so we've seen wiring diagrams as categories. Wiring diagrams also form an operad, so they have a hierarchical notion of composition. And um, this notion of composition is substitution. So it's the operation of 
of taking some boxes in the diagram and replacing them with other wiring diagrams to get a larger diagram. And um, so it's substitution. And um, this is it's really the fundamental operation, right? Uh, it, uh, certainly in the way that it's implemented, because the way, so to illustrate this, I want to show more or less exactly how Compose is actually implemented in uh, the library for wiring diagrams. So how do you compose two wiring diagrams? So what you do is you start with an empty diagram, you add two boxes corresponding to those two wiring diagrams. Right, so I have a picture now with, uh, with two boxes. Then you wire them up in, in series. And then all the work happens by then substituting, so if these are other diagrams, calling substitute then basically removes these outer boxes and gives you one big diagram. So substitute really does all the work here. Um, and I want to mention that there's an operation which is somehow inverse to this. Um, I don't know if it has a standard name or not. I call it encapsulation. So in other words, taking a, a sub-diagram of a wiring diagram and we're just replacing it with a single box. So you can also do that. Okay, so now the getting back to this original picture I drew with the three different representations of morphisms. So we now have these symbolic morphism expressions and we also have wiring diagrams and so it's natural to ask how can we pass back and forth between these two different representations. And so in one direction it's actually easy. So to go from a morphism expression to a wiring diagram it should be con conceptually straightforward because you know, to every morphism expression, there's a unique wiring diagram that represents it. So, and, and, and to implement it, it turns out to be quite easy too, because once you've, you know, defined wiring diagrams as an instance of, say, symmetric monodal category, all you have to do is like, kind of like walk that expression tree and apply those operations, and it just comes right out. Um, so, it's the other direction which is harder, right? So, it's harder conceptually because multiple morphism expressions can correspond to the same wiring diagram. So this is, so I'll, you'll see a concrete example of this later, but this is basically, so but you want to think here of like the interchange law, right? So but we'll see it later if you're not familiar with that. Um, and so CatLab has some algorithms for doing this. Um, they're sort of um, in, inspired by what exists in the literature for um, series parallel digraphs. So this is maybe a little unfair, but I think of series parallel digraphs as being kind of like monoda categories, but like worse. Um, and uh, one caveat here is that like, I don't actually really understand all of the mathematical properties of, of this algorithm. So this is, you know, one of the points that I, side points I'd like to make is that, you know, often when you start thinking about how do I take math and, and really make it concrete, on a computer, you, you do actually encounter new mathematical problems as well, right? So this is an example where you actually end up with an interesting sort of algorithmic question that you might not otherwise think about. Yeah? Is it fair to say that uh, you are defining basically a, a bicategory and then you're thinking of the variant diagrams as a, an e the equivalence classes of the morphism which are the morphism in your bicategory. Maybe. I mean, there is this perspective on rewriting where, like, you kind of shift it up to one level higher, right? So, like, if you're rewriting morphisms, those are, like, two cells, and is that what you're getting at, or? No, it's just that you're, so you're working uh, with bicategories, right? Because you have these expressions which uh, evaluate the same uh, morphism when you apply the, the axons, right? Mm -hmm. But really, you are working in this even more general structure than a category. Yes, I mean, I think you, I think you can think of it that way. It's like it's like a where like everything is like weak, and so you're like in a higher. Yeah, yeah. I don't know entirely what are the implications of that perspective, but yeah, I think it is probably a valid perspective. It might be worth thinking about. That's this idea. Yeah. Yeah. I encountered that. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. So that's good thing to to talk about for more later. Yeah. 
So, um, so to, to make this a little more concrete, so we're going to explore what happens when you round trip. So you start with an expression, you convert it to a wiring diagram, and then you convert it back to an expression. So really we just call two wiring diagram, and then on the result we're going to call to hom expert or to morphism expression and we do need to tell it what what symbolic system we want to work with so we're going to be working in here with a, a Cartesian monoidal category. Um, so here I'm creating uh, an expression the first uh, block where um, this is a, a composition of, of products and if I round trip that I get back, it, it, in effect, the interchange law ends up being applied by this process. And one of the properties that this algorithm has, or which it, I believe it has, is that it prefers, basically, it, it tries to like give a maximally parallel decomposition, right? So like, it, it, it favors th this form over this one. And if I were to take this expression and round trip it again, I just get back the same thing. So somehow it seems to be normalizing that, but is it really, does it really always work? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so um, another thing that you kind of can see coming out of this are, are what are sometimes called like the, yes? So I was just wondering what actually is the algorithm? Or like how, like yeah. how is it distinguished among all possible algorithms? Yeah, so I, I haven't described it, but basically what it does in a nutshell is it's based on things called like series and parallel reductions. So you basically look for instances where you can do, if you have things in series, it will collapse those into a composition, and likewise in, in parallel it will do that, and there's certain rules for when it will apply them. And then there's subtleties though, you, you sometimes also have to do this thing called transitive reduction, like when you have identities floating around. So it, th there are several pieces to it, and it's kind of a, it's a complicated thing, and I'm not really describing it here. In its, in its entirety, yeah. Yeah, but like, what is the best? Is this the is this the a good algorithm for this? Is this the best algorithm for this? I don't know. I mean, like, I think a lot of these questions, like, people, you know, it's it's like an open question to to understand these things better. I don't know of much literature that addresses it directly. Um. So, right. So another thing we can see here is that. Um, so if you're not familiar with like, com like you know supplies of comonoids and stuff, this this part may be uh, not clear. But for those who are, um, if you have like, so this is a copying operation. So you, if I, I can take a copy of something that's a, a product of type A times B and get something of type A times B times A times B, and uh, when you round trip that, you recover a version of a, a different representation for that and that sort of falls out automatically for this process and so the equality of these two these two expressions are equal and that's one of the you know basically the uh, coherence axioms for for what Brendan and David have called a supply of comonoids and you, and you likewise recover the other one for for deleting okay okay so let me see how I'm doing on time Okay, um, I would like to, so there's a lot of uh, different facilities in CATLAB for drawing pictures, you know, everyone likes pictures, you want to be able to, to generate them. Um, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to like explain how it all works, but in a nutshell there are like two different kind of pathways you can take. So. One is to think of this morphism, so this process I just sketched of taking a wiring diagram and creating a, a symbolic expression for it can be seen as doing like the first step of a graph layout algorithm. So you can take that and actually use that expression to, to produce a layout. So that's one way you can try to get layouts. And then we have some different backgrounds, sorry, backends for that, like one generates TIXZ, Another generates like SVG using this thing called compose.jl, which is a Julia thing. And there's a totally different route you can take, which is to just take the wiring diagram and pipe it to some other tool which knows how to do layout of, 
of DAGs, and so we have support for GraphViz. So um, here are some, there are lots of different, um, you know, settings you can toggle. So here are some things in GraphViz and in Compose.jl and TixC. So I guess all I really say about this is that, you know, even if you're a, a mathematician primarily and you're not really so interested in, like, computational stuff, you might still benefit from drawing some pictures because everyone needs pictures. And so those capabilities are there and they're continually being improved. Okay, let's get this. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the third part of the third representation for morphisms that I mentioned, which is uh, some kind of code representation, right? So, um, and CatLab currently has facilities to transform between certain fragments of the Julia programming language to and from other kinds of morphism representations. So, uh, but before I show that, um, it will be convenient for us to basically, we're going to present a little category here. So again, there's kind of a macro for this that provides some syntactic sugar. So basically, I just, I'm going to kind of work with sort of kind of, you know, math functions here because I want to eventually generate Julia code. So I'll have um, some object R, which just represents the real numbers, and sine and cosine and uh, addition and multiplication. Okay, and then um, I'll write a little helper function to get those generators by name. And um, I'll first create, uh, and so in this first block I'm creating um, an expression by, you know, composing and tensoring and all that stuff. So it's not super easy maybe to just read off what formula this is, um, but you can, using the program submodule, you can compile this into a Julia function. It generates some code. So you can see that, okay, I'm taking the input x, computing the sine of it, also the cosine of it, then I multiply those two things together and return the result. So this is just computing the function sine x times cosine x. Um, so that's one direction. Um, and you can also go um, in the other direction, except I found it more convenient to go actually to wiring diagrams here. So there's uh, a, a, a facility to take Julia code, not any old Julia code, but some fragment of it, and to generate wiring diagrams for that. So here I'm showing the same function. I'm going from some Julia code that computes that uh, to this to this diagram. And um, there are lots of ways you could write the same function in Julia. So here's another one in sort of a more like lambda style syntax. Um, and, and that naturally gives you the same diagram back. That's what we're checking here in this equality. Yes? For programs that might not be computation circuits like this is, yeah. it would have control flow or yeah. This is both a category theory question. Yeah, it's it's Julia. it's both. So like one thing that would be cool is like for a Julia program with looping, like the in category theory that's often represented by like traces, like the ability to draw feedback. So it would be cool to figure out how to map those things together, but I haven't done that yet. So right now, like these programs, like they don't have control flow. But it, that's definitely a good thing to 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 think about. Yeah. Okay, so now um, I want to mention, um, I want to sketch uh, a few applications that I and also some other people have done with CatLab just to give you a flavor of how it's been used. And I won't be able to do any of these justice because uh, I just have sort of one slide for each of them, but still um, it will hopefully give you some flavor. So this is a project that... Um, I started when I was at an intern at IBM Research, and then I've continued some while at Stanford. Um, and the idea of, of this project was to try to um, take code for data science, so code doing data analysis or machine learning, and extract a, a semantic representation of that, which is independent of the underlying um, languages and libraries used. So there's sort of a, there's an ontology-based approach to this that I've sort of been exploring and um, the way 
Without getting into the details, though, CATLAB is used here to basically do the, you know, there's a program analysis piece, which is sort of language specific, doesn't have much to do with CATLAB, that produces like a data flow graph representation of a program. But then, you know, I, I, I use CATLAB to do the processing on, on this thing to, to do basically transformations on these wiring diagrams. So nothing too complex there, but just an example of using wiring diagrams as a, as a data structure. It's a very useful data structure. Yes? Um, sorry, what sort of transformations are you doing and how is that useful? Ba basically, I'm, I'm doing a, a f monoidal functor, right? So like I have some ontology which says like, oh, this function in R expands to like this program in some abstract semantic language and then I basically so it's conceptually pretty straightforward like I'm just I'm kind of hitting this thing with a one nodal functor and expanding some of these boxes so this is a, a, a simple example that doesn't bring it out super well because none of these expansions are too involved but that's kind of the idea and yeah sorry, but, um, what does that do for the underlying like data science well the idea the idea here is that um, yeah, I guess I didn't explain the motivation too well. So but the idea here is to be able to like, so right now in, in data science, like there's a real proliferation of, of languages and libraries and technologies. So the idea behind this project was to try to have some method for creating semantic representations which would allow you to compare analyses conducted using different tools on like the same footing. That was part of the motivation at least, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... Another uh, short project that uh, I was involved in along with um, Jade Master and Shaheen Yusfi and uh, Archimedes Canido at, um, at Siemens, uh, we did a, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a toy project in a way, but it's a proof of concept. So we uh, basically were playing around with um, planning problems using string diagrams. So we were working in the, as sort of a proxy for a more realistic you know, robot assembly domain. We were working with Lego assembly and we were sort of simulating it in Minecraft. So we would synthesize these plans that we represented as wiring diagrams and um, had a kind of a pipeline that we could do to go from some description of the connectivity of the, the model to a plan, to different kinds of plans, to the generation of a, of a schedule and ultimately to like the assembly of this thing in Minecraft by some number of workers. So prototype for sure, but I think that actually like planning in like is, is in general like an area that's like very ripe for applied category theory work and there's been some other works on this recently and I, I bet there'll be more. So, and lastly I'll mention a project, I'm not involved with, with this one so I can only sort of sketch edit. Um, this project is being led by uh, James Fairbanks, who's at GTRI. And actually, I believe he's due to come visit you guys at some point. So, so I guess consider this a very small preview of that. Um, this group is interested in s basically um, s uh, semantic representation and, and particularly like model transformation for all sorts of kinds of scientific models, right? So the idea is that like if I could have a good, um, you know, computational representation of a scientific model, I could, you know, sort of automate or at least like record different kinds of transformations you can do to models to get new models. And they've been focusing, I think, so far a lot on epidemiological models. So like the susceptible, infected, recovered models, both in the agent-based form and ODEs, and they have a, a Julia package for this called Semantic Models JL, and I know that they're using CatLab under the hood for some stuff, although I don't know the details, so you can look forward to that talk. Um, okay, so to wrap up here, I just want to mention um, sort of where I like to see this project go. So, and there's a whole lot of different things to explore. I mean, the way I see it right now, like the, the functionality that exists, like it's like a kind of a, I think it's a reasonable foundation. You can already do some useful stuff, but there's a whole lot of capabilities that, that you would like to have that don't yet exist and for which people both need to do 
mathematical and algorithmic and, and also implementation work. So one is sort of in the area of compute, like the kind of computer algebraic functionality. So there's a lot of stuff here you might want to have. So um, the ability to do rewriting on both symbolic expressions and wiring diagrams, so kind of like classic computer algebra stuff, but somehow it's not, it, it's, all, it's kind of a twist when you have categories involved because these structures are more complicated. Being able to do things like solve word problems um, is obviously really nice to have, also not easy. Um, I'd also like to um, uh, explore more like what are the right sort of formalisms for this like I mentioned earlier, like is it GATS or is it something else? So that's one area. Um, another thing that I really like to do and have other people involved with is like, can we kind of create a, a standard library, if you will, of some of some nice applications of of category theory? So um, things where people have maybe already done some of the math, but like, can we really make it make it e effective and into a, and into a, a tool? So. Uh, the first one I'll mention is uh, linear algebra. So there's kind of two different things which you get depending on kind of which monodal product you look at. So like for the direct sum, there's this um, graphical linear algebra, which is uh, uh, very cool. Um, and then there's also involving the, the tensor product, um, a lot of stuff about like tensor networks. So I would like to, and I think this is a, area where Julia would really shine too. Julia has excellent facilities for numerical linear algebra. So I'm hoping that um, uh, sometime in during the next year we'll, we'll have something in, in this area kind of to showcase what you can do. Um, and then there are many other areas that you might want to do things in. I've mentioned just a few of them here. Um, but so I mean this so kind of you know beyond so I think this really is driven also by like what people are, are interested in. Okay, so I'll conclude with that. I just want to say here at the end that like um, um, I'm, I'm definitely um, looking both for people who are interested in using CatLab as well as people who might be interested in, in developing it. I'm happy to like support that in any way that I can like through uh, helping people or and uh, reviewing code and so forth. So if that's something that interests you at all, definitely uh, come talk to me. Um, you can do that on GitHub or we, we now have a little Slack channel on the Julia Slack. And if all else fails, uh, definitely you can, you can also just send me an email. So thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's extremely good for you know tracing monodial categories, right? So, but have you thought about what happens when you have, for example, like a second tensor structure, like a linear logic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> this. Is, that gets messy, right? Yeah, this has been a problem for me and other people for a long time. I don't know what the answer is, but it comes up all the time. Like you often, often one is like and and or, like you know, product and sum. He, he, he's asking, um, like, so what happens when you have like two monodal product structures floating around? And it, it happens all the time, and I, I don't know of a good answer, and I don't, if like, I think in general, like, that would be a very practical thing for like, people to try to figure out is what's a good way to handle those kind of situations. Yeah. Yeah. What happens when you round trip on the wiring diagram side? Like if you go from wiring diagram to expression to wiring diagram, you should always get the same thing. Okay. So it's not it shouldn't be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you could write equals equals and it would turn out true. Yeah, the only thing that might not be the case is that like the vertex labels might have got switched, but mm -hmm. up to like the right notion of equality, which is really isomorphism, they should be the same. Yeah. I didn't quite get it from because I don't know Julia. Yeah. Do you use like port names or just indices? Oh, for like the ports? The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So right now I just use indices. I was actually talking to David about this earlier today. I mean, 
Um, sometimes it's convenient to have names, so I think eventually it'd be nice to support both. But right now it's just numerical indexing for the ports. Now, that being said, you can attach like extra data to the ports. Like you could put it in there, but it's not like kind of first class support for that, let's say. I guess for the morphemous fractions, it's useful to use indices, right? Because then you have this kind of stack machine, right? Mm. And, uh, but for the network, you know, for the. Yeah, so you'll notice that for like code generation, like there's no information that you can use to make up variable names, right? Really. I mean, like, if you had the ports given some label, you could at least, you could come up with better variable names. You could parse V3, V1, V2. That's why I said I don't know Julia, right? But yeah. When I read that, like, can you actually, you know, use the variable names that you're using, like X and V2? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you could use any variable names here it would not affect the function that's defined, nor would it affect how it gets parsed on the other side. It's basically the, both the wiring diagrams and the symbolic expressions are both point free in a sense. So there are no variables. So all the variables disappear when you move out from away from that representation. Yes? In the signature or whatever, can I add a, something that said sine squared plus cosine squared equals one? Like can I add that rewrite or something? Yeah, not not yet, but like that's the sort of axiom that you'd also want to be able to like write down. Actually, you you can okay. Actually, in a presentation, you can write that. Mm -hmm. It'll let you, but right now you didn't really do anything. It didn't really help you to, to do it. So, but yeah, that's an area where it's like yeah, it'd be nice to have some rewriting. But but you know, on the other hand, I I don't want to like reimplement Mathematica, right? <laughs> like that's not like a feasible thing. So I think that. So figuring out like what, how to break down that problem is, yeah, I don't know. Because you could really spend years and years just mm -hmm. doing that stuff, which, yeah. It's more like a proof assistant where like, if yeah. someone knew they could replace science, yeah. if they see it, you yeah. let them replace it whenever the equation is there, but yeah. they have to do the work of showing you that. Yeah, it's that would definitely be a nice thing to have, for sure. Yeah? Um, I'd love to hear more about the three things you mentioned briefly at the end of like, yeah, sorry, that was pretty fast. Is there is there one in um, particular that? Uh, the last one about scientific models. Yeah, well, that's the one I know least about, but okay, I can, can I can one. try. <laughs> I can. Yeah, okay. So maybe one of these two. I was involved in these two, so I I can probably explain things better. Is the planning one? Yeah. So okay. So for the planning one, um. Yeah. So. This, the cat lab stuff f comes in in a couple different ways. So um, there's nothing directly in it right now that actually forms these plans for wiring diagrams. Like it provides the data structures and stuff, but those algorithms are not built into cat lab. And, and that's something where I'd actually like to see like um, some more, uh, some growth there because, you know, I, I, I think that these, Lots of things that don't look like planning can also be kind of formulated as planning, right? Like it's like I have this type and I want to get to it from here and I have some operations I can do and so how do I put them together to do that? Like that's a fairly generic computational problem that it would be nice to get more stuff for. But at the very least right now we're using CatLab to represent these plans. And then we also are actually, this part's a little interesting, we're also using the functionality to go from wiring diagrams to expressions as part of the, the scheduling part. So you can think of like this decomposition as, a, as an expression is telling you like which things do I want to do in series or in parallel in, it ha in a more fine-grained way than what you get in the wiring diagram. The wiring diagram kind of tells you like what you could do in parallel without really saying like that you will. So, um, so I think this is one area where these different morphism, it's actually interesting to have different representations for morphisms because they encode different kinds of, like a more detailed representation actually like can be, has an, have an interpretation sometimes. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah.
So you just got the parallel time by round tripping the sequential time? Um, no. So th basically, these are generated by some simple algorithm. Um, but to go from basically either of these plans to an actual schedule which says like, okay, like in this time step, I have this many workers and I'm going to tell them to do this, this person will do this thing and this person will do this thing. That's where we're actually first going to like expressions and using that to structure the schedule. What the parallel plan gives you is more capability for parallelism. Like you, you could, like if you had you could execute it like in serial. Like if you had one worker, you would be forced to basically serialize it anyway. So at least in the way we're interpreting, interpreting these wiring diagrams, these are like, this so-called like parallel plan has more potential for parallelism, but how much parallelism you actually get depends on what resources you have available. But yeah, there are probably other ways to think about this too. I mean, I, I mean, you know, yeah. Um, so you could also do a, a topological uh, sort, um, and that would give you, uh, well, yeah, I mean. It would do one thing at a time. It, it would, yeah, it would give you a linear ordering, which wouldn't necessarily tell you what to do when. It would just tell you that as long as, the, by the time I get to something, I've done everything else I need to beforehand. Um, I thought there was a sort of standard algorithms. Like, where does category theory present itself? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of of uh, of work on this stuff. So, I mean, for me, I wouldn't want to say that. Like, I think it's useful to use wiring diagrams to represent these plans, but I wouldn't want to claim that. Like, the the I wouldn't want to claim that like the scheduling algorithm is like necessarily that better than what's out there. It's just it, it kind of, but it does fall out of this stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, Evan, um, from a practical matter, if you want to do simulation, mm -hmm. let's say you built the wiring diagram and you're happy with it, what would be kind of programmatically the next step? implement certain parameters and data or whatever into a, a step to a simulation? Yeah. Um, you mean like in this setting here? Yeah. Well, um, I guess what you ha what's missing between the, like this representation of a plan and like a, something that you could actually run in your simulator is that like, well, Minecraft's sort of a discrete for us, it's like a discrete world. But basically, so at, at every time step, you have to say, like, if I have some number of workers, like, what s snaps are they actually performing at that time step? And, and that's not included in this representation of the plan. And so what we've kind of been discussing is, like, what are the, how can you, how could you get from a plan to, to that, to a schedule? And so that's where things like a topological sort or the other things start to come in. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mean in this work here? Uh, or like... Or, this, or any of the three applications. In any of the three applications. Well, in this application, I think it's very natural to think of this like semantic enrichment process as just a functor. So, and, and I mean, you can always like, you know, you can always take something that is expressed categorically and like compile away the category theory and, and, and if you want to. Uh, so, I mean... It's, you know, what do I see the value of this perspective as being? It's not always that, like, category theory is, it's not like category theory is necessarily giving you a capability that you simply 
couldn't do without category theory. But it's saying that like, like what would I hope for for like CatLab? It's like certain kinds of algorithms and and procedures like occur in all sorts of different areas, right? So like if you can have a generic planning algorithm that works on symmetric monoidal categories, you could conceivably use that for lots of different things besides like assembling Legos, right? So like that that to me is like what the the, the value in this per perspective is and um, I think it's sometimes not always the right question to ask like, oh, well like, you know, what did category theory let you do that you couldn't do uh, before? It's more like how does it help you understand that and connect it to other things? That's me, my that me personal take. Are yeah. The, are the functions the nodes or the edges in that picture? The functions are the uh, nodes and the edges are the, what does that mean the data the types. Okay, so the, so the functor is like going, it'll map like a morphism, which is like a wiring diagram, to another one. And so, and, and it's, and what's functorial about it is that like, you get this thing basically by taking each of these and then hitting it with the functor. And then that whole, so, oh, I see. Okay. right? Yeah. So, so the, and so it's, I think, helpful to, you know, you can definitely rewrite the wiring diagrams without thinking about functors, but like it, once you, it's, it's kind of, I think, helpful to think about it that way because once you know this vocabulary, you can basically say in one sentence what it's doing and people can understand what it is. Yes. Like, like yeah, no, it's that's not an an area that I I know well, but I think definitely part of the idea with these applications that I was mentioning at the end would be to try to connect it like to the software that people have written for those kinds of things, right? So one thing I am familiar with is like some of the like iTensor, some of these like tensor manipulation libraries, right? Can you can you take a, a morphism expression representing some um, tensor out of by composing and, and doing the things you can do, and then translate that into you know the software? I think I think those are the kind of things that it's cool to be able to do. Yeah. So um, we have coffee and cookies after this in the main room over there. Yeah. So we can let people go, and uh, I'll walk over anyone who wants to talk more with Evan or anyone else. Um, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you.